Hello everyone and welcome to this latest episode of Book Time with Elvis with me, Mark. And, you know, I'm continuing with my essays and uh, today we have a very nice one actually for you from G.K. Chesterton. It's called The Boredom of Butterflies and it comes from his collection Fads and Fancies. Uh, so let's push on with it, shall we? The Boredom of Butterflies. There is one thing which critics perhaps tend to forget when they complain that Mr. H.G. Wells no longer concerns himself with telling a story. It is that nobody else could interest and excite us so much without telling a story. It is possible to read one of his recent novels almost without knowing the story at all. It is possible to dip into it as into a book of essays and pick up opinions here and there. But all the essays are brilliant essays, and all the opinions are striking opinions. It does not matter does not much matter who holds the opinions, it is possible that the author does not hold them at all, and pretty certain that he will not hold them long. But nobody else could make such a splendid stuff out of the ve very refuse of his rejected opinions. Seen from this side, even what is called his failure must be recognised as a remarkable success. The personal story may fade away, but it is something of an achievement to be still interesting after becoming impersonal like the achievement of the Cheshire cat who could grin when he was no longer there. Moreover, these impersonal and even irresponsible opinions of Mr. Wells, though never conclusive, are always suggestive. Each is a good starting point for thought, if only for the thought that refutes it. In short, the critics of Mr. Wells rather exaggerate the danger of his story running to speculation, as if it were merely running to seed. Anyhow, they ought to remember that there are two meanings in running to seed, and one of them is connected with seed time. I have, however, a particular reason for mentioning the matter here. I confess there is more to one of Mr. Wells' recent novels than I have both read and not read. I am never quite sure that I have read all Shakespeare or all Boswell's Johnson, because I have so long had the habit of opening them anywhere. So I have opened the works of Mr. Wells anywhere and had great fun out of the essays that would have seemed only long parentheses in the story. But on getting to rather closer grips with the last of his stories, The Secret Places of the Heart, I think I have caught a glimpse of a difficulty in this sort of narrative, which is something deeper than mere digression. In a story like Pickwick or Tristram Shandy, digression is never disappointment, but in this case, differing as I do, from the merely hostile critics, I cannot dispel the atmosphere of disappointment. The story seems inconclusive, in a sense beyond anything merely inconsistent, and I fancy I can guess why. A pedantic logician may perhaps imagine that a thing can only be inconclusive at the conclusion, but I will boldly claim the liberty in language of saying that this sort of thing is inconclusive from the start. It begins inconclusive, and in that sense begins dull. The hero begins by telling the doctor about immutable flux of flirtation, about his own experiments as a philanderer, always flitting like a butterfly from flower to flower. Now it is highly probable that the diary of a butterfly would be very dull, even if it were only the diary of a day. His round need to be no more really amusing than the postman's, since he has no serious spiritual interest in any of his places of call. Now by starting his hero as a philosopher, and also philanderer, and taking seriously his philosophy of philandering, the author as good as tells us, to start with, that his hero will not have any serious adventures at all. At the beginning of the story he practically tells us there will be no story. The story of a fickle man is not a story at all, because there is no strain or resistance in it. Somebody talked about tales with a twist, and it is certain that all tales are tales with a tug. All the most subtle truths of literature to be found in legend. There is no better test of truth of serious fiction than the simple truths to be found in a fairy tale or an old ballad. Now, in the whole of folklore, there is no such thing as free love. There is such a thing as false love. There is also another thing which the old ballads always talk of as true love. But the story always turns on the keeping of a bond or the breaking of it and this quite apart from orthodox morality in the matter of the marriage bond. The love may be in the strict sense sinful, but it is never anarchical. There was quite as little freedom for Lancelot as for Arthur, quite as little mere philandering in the philosophy of Tristram, 
as in the philosophy of Galahad. It may have been unlawful love, but it certainly was not lawless love. In the old ballads there is the triumph of true love, as in The Bailiff's Daughter of Islington, or the tragedy of true love, as in Helen of Kirk Connell Lee, or the tragedy of false love, as in the ballad of O oh, Whaley Whaley Up the Bank. But there is neither triumph nor tragedy in the idea of avowedly transient love, and no literature will ever be made out of it, except the very lightest literature of satire. And even the satire must be a satire of fickleness, and therefore involve an indirect ideal of fidelity. But you cannot make any enduring literature out of love conscious that it will not endure. Even if this mutability were working as morality, it would still be unworkable as art. The decadents used to say that things like the marriage vow might be very convenient for commonplace public purposes, but had no place in the world of beauty and imagination. The truth is exactly the other way. The truth is that if marriage had not existed, it would have been necessary for artists to invent it. The truth is that if constancy had never been needed as a social requirement, it would still have been created out of cloud and air as a poetical requirement. If ever monogamy is abandoned in practice, it will linger in legend and in literature. When society is haunted by the butterfly flitting from flower to flower, poetry will still be describing the desire of the moth for the star, and it will be a fixed star. Literature must always revolve around loyalties for a rudimentary psychological reason, which is simply the nature of narrative. You cannot tell a story without the idea of pursuing a purpose and sticking to a point. You cannot tell a story without the idea of the quest, the idea of the vow, even if it be only the idea of the wager. Perhaps the most modern equivalent to the man who makes a vow is the man who makes a bet, but he must not hedge on a bet, still less must he Welsh, or do a bolt when he has made a bet. Even if the story ends with his doing so, the dramatic emotion depends on our realising the dishonesty of his doing so. That is, the drama depends on the keeping or breaking of a bond, if it be only a bet. A man wandering about a race course making bets that nobody took seriously would be merely a bore. And so the hero wandering through a novel making vows of love that nobody took seriously is merely a bore. The point here is not so much that morali morally it cannot be a credible, creditable story, but that artistically it cannot be a story at all. Art is born when the temporary touches the eternal. The shock of beauty is when the irresistible force hits the immovable post. Thus, in the last novel of Mr. Wells, what is inconclusive in the second part is largely due to what is convincing in the first part. By the time that the hero meets his new heroine on Salisbury, Salisbury, Salisbury Plain, he has seriously convinced us there is nothing heroic about him and that nothing heroic will happen to him, at any rate in that department. He disenchants the enchantment beforehand and warns the reader against even a momentary illusion. When once a man looks forward as well as backward to disillusionment, no romance can be made of him. Uh, prof <laughs> I always have problems with this word. Profligacy may be made romantic precisely when it implies some betrayal or breaking of a law, but polygamy is not in the least romantic. Polygamy is dull to the point of respectability, when a man looks forward to a number of wives as he does to a number of cigarettes, you can no more make a book out of them than out of the bills from his tobacconist. Anything having the character of a Turkish harem has also something of the character of a turkey carpet. It is not a portrait, or even a picture, but a pattern. We may at the moment be looking at one highly coloured and even flamboyant figure in the carpet, but we know that on every side, in front as well as behind, the image is repeated without purpose and without finality. So thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it, and I shall see you soon. Do take care. Bye-bye.